Have you ever developed a crush on your art teacher and then 45 years later cast your daughter as the love interest in a movie you made? Some are calling it the greatest act of simping of 2021. Hello, this is the Bomb Squad Podcast. I'm Austin Zwiebelman, today's host. And with me I have... I'm Tanner Richard Kraft. Hey, that's identity theft. That's very serious crime. I'm Tanner Richard Kraft. Fine, I'm Tanner Insel. And stopping by today from her eponymous YouTube channel is our special guest. Hi, I'm Sydney Volpe. I'm the female perspective. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. Uh, today's film is Licorice Pizza, a very nostalgic look at the San Fernando Valley in the 1970s, featuring Cooper Hoffman and Elena Hyam as the very first teenagers in all of cinema to have real acne. Before we jump in, let's talk Woo! about Paul Thomas Anderson, the man who dropped out of NYU film school because his professor shit on Terminator 2 and then proceeded to give Paul a C plus when he turned in a script page written by Pulitzer drama prize winner David f***ing Mamet. And I said, all right, now I know I'm right. And there's a wonderful thing that if you drop out quick enough, you can get your tuition back. <laughs> so I all right, today's first question is, what's your favorite Paul Thomas Anderson film, and what do you think makes PTA stand out as a director? Tanner, we're going to have you go first. My favorite Paul Thomas Anderson movie is, and probably always will be, Punch Drunk Love. Uh, what can I say? I'm a sucker for the Sandman. Uh, I do love Adam Sandler. I love the way that movie looks. I love the sort of like really just these vibrant colors and the sort of like grimy world kind of thing. I'm a simp for mattress salesmen, so you know. <laughs> Queen mattress sets for $99 and king sets for $129. And, you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman uh, got in the bag. It's one of my favorite Seymour Hoffman performances. It was my favorite Adam Sandler performance until our, the legend Howie Ratner came on the scene. Rest in peace, Howie. What makes uh, Paul Thomas Anderson uh, stand out as a director to, to me is um, everything he makes is just baller. He's such a master of the craft. He makes it look easy. I swear to God, the man makes it look easy. I think more than anything, it's the expert way he frames and blocks his characters. Uh, not so much the blocking, more the framing, especially now that he shoots his own movies a lot of the time. You could show me a PTA movie and I could show you 30, 50, 70 shots I would want to be my desktop wallpaper. He's a real master at making pretty images and he makes the most engaging characters with his writing. There's always these like weird, quirky characters, but at the same time, that feels feel very, very real. Punch Drug Love is like a movie filled with insane characters. The main character is like buying a bunch of cello to try and get frequent flyer miles, but it feels so real. It feels like it's a real person in a real place. So I, I think it's that. It's the expert control of the camera and the real naturalistic feel of it all. Back to you, Austin. One of the reasons that that character might have felt real is because it's based on a real thing that actually happened with a real yogurt contest. Look it up. It's crazy. American Airlines hated life. We're probably going to go with somebody who's a little more familiar with talking about PTA. Sydney, what's your favorite PTA movie and what do you think makes him stand out? My favorite PTA movie is <laughs> There Will Be Blood, which is a popular pick, but popular for a reason. I just like watching Paul Dano get the shit beat out of him sometimes. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, I think it's like a modern masterpiece just separately from the rest of his filmography and a really great example of how so often he takes a specific period of American transition and how these characters are a product of that and also exploring Daniel Day-Lewis's character as a you know a character study and this cycle of greed and sociopathy and bringing in this other thing I love so much about him found family and fatherhood and human connection all this stuff you've heard before but there will be blood licorice pizza comes close for sure because that film resonates with me personally a lot but I think there will be blood will always take the top spot especially because it was one of my first films that got me to really start thinking critically about film and kind of changed the way that I saw and thought about film. That's absolutely fantastic. And I know, Tim, you haven't seen as much of PTA's catalog as other people mm -hmm. might have. From what you have seen, which one's your favorite and what do you think makes him stand out? So, Paul Thomas Anderson is a director who has a filmography full of films that when people mention them to me, I say things like, oh yeah, I've been meaning to watch that one. King, sh king, sh 
me with Robert Altman. I, I guess I would say, like Tanner, my favorite is Punch Drunk Love. Um, I watched that one a couple of years ago with my girlfriend at the time, and we both enjoyed it a lot. It was a really solid movie with some great characters. It was a rare opportunity for Adam Sandler to deliver a dramatic role. He proves that like, he can do like real acting. And I think that that's just like a great little example of that. There's just a lot of really great emotional character beats. And just based on like the little bit of a, that I've seen of his works, like I think a lot of what makes him sort of stand out is like his characters all have this sort of uh, quirkiness to them, but in a way that like feels very genuine. I've noticed especially in like his like asshole characters is like, they're very terrifying in this uniquely hilarious way. And I think that that makes uh, his movies really interesting to watch is just like seeing these like people who are just doing these terrible things and just being incredibly intimidating in this just very funny way. I did watch There Will Be Blood earlier this week, finally, and I really liked that one. You hadn't seen it before? I hadn't yeah, seen it before. What? <laughs> I've watched it this week though, and I liked it. Where's your film school degree? No, um, it. it's packed out there, Tanner. <laughs> yeah, that's um, about where it belongs. Useless hey, piece of paper. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. I meant to watch uh, Phantom Thread last night, but my, I was tired and my brain was soup, so I did not watch it. That's the second best one. Come on, man. Is it? I will watch it at some point. I like when PTA does romance. <laughs> up romance. But yeah, to sum it up, what I've seen of his works, pretty solid. And uh, interested to finally get around to watching the other ones. Boogie Nights is one that I have been saving for the inevitable eventual podcast. Coming in October. But <laughs> next month, our school, Webster, is doing a lineup of just f***ing baller movies in 35mm. And Boogie Nights is one of them. So I will be going to see that. I'm going to be there too. Nice. So yeah, that's pretty much my thoughts. Back to you, Mr. Austin. I'm going to be at that screening dressed as John Holmes. It's going to be so <laughs> rad. So. Speaking of, my favorite film is Boogie Nights because I saw it in high school. And not only is it sort of a technical masterpiece for a sophomore effort into feature filmmaking, but it also appealed to my tastes at the time heavily. Like the idea that the 70s were so great and that adult actors could be these empathetic characters and that the music my dad played in the car growing up was cool enough to be in a feature film. Pretty gratifying. I think he's special because both phases of his filmmaking career were handled very intelligently. Like there's the pre, there will be blood, cocaine craziness, where there's a lot of dynamic camera movement and a lot of storytelling, mostly for intensity's sake, heartfelt as it can be at times. And then there's his weird Twilight Old Man catalog, where he makes these obscenely rich period pieces that focus on like the finer details of what the performers are doing. And just a couple quicker ones for people who aren't familiar with his work, a more superficial things. Paul's an incredibly gifted director when it comes to finding actors. He gets a great performance out of everybody, no matter how old or new they are to the craft of acting. When he does wide shots, the blocking is nuts. Tanner's right, they're eye candy. Uh, he actually got the lead guitarist of Radiohead to do the score for his last five films. Uh, he was confident enough in his abilities to adapt a book by the insanely complex author Thomas Pynchon, this madman. And of course, his films contain these wonders that go on for ages against the will of God in physics. So now that we've established our relationship with the cre creative mind behind today's film, let's hop in and talk about Licorice Pizza. After an underwhelming $24 million at the box office against a $40 million budget, now out on VOD as of February 18th, one can assume more people might be talking about this on the internet now, so let's ride the wave. Everybody, what are your overall thoughts on Licorice Pizza? Uh, we're gonna start with Sydney. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> my, <laughs> my overall thoughts. So I just saw Licorice Pizza like two hours ago for the third time and inter like a lot to pick up on on the third viewing. But overall thoughts is that as a lot of people are saying, it's probably PTA's like sweetest movie. He feels very like relaxed in his filmmaking compared to a lot of his other films. And I'm sure we'll talk later about the inspiration for the film. But 
overall, I just see it as another kind of this really, really complex and dysfunctional relationship, again, happening in this period of time, the 70s. And it is kind of like what's going on seems like it's glorified, but what's kind of happening around that is a lot darker and is the reason why these two people kind of gravitate towards each other and I just think it's like such a powerful powerful like emotional experience watching these two people kind of the ebbs and flows of their relationship the form that their relationship takes and then also just what it means to be stuck in between childhood and adulthood and that's why this resonates with me a lot right now because I'm 22 the same age as Tanner believe it or not I'm 23 excuse you I used to be with it but then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it, and what's it seems weird and scary to me. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm almost 23. Get on my level. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just think it's another just really, really powerful dynamic between two people and these really imperfect characters. That's what I love so much. It's just he's so in love with like human imperfection. So yeah, it's a movie that I, I love a lot. You're 22? Terry, you're not supposed to ask a lady how, how old they are. You're not supposed to ask that. You're not supposed to ask a girl how old she is. Yeah, she literally says that in the movie. She's like, you're not supposed to ask someone that. I'm autistic. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the general <laughs> rundown. Tim, you just got back from fancy, rich, bougie person land, seeing the movie yeah, in theaters. Yeah. None that of theater us, sucks. None <laughs> of us knew the movie was coming out on VOD because they dropped it in a bunch of USB drives from, like, paratrooper crews in the middle of the night or something. Tim, it's fresh in your mind. What do you think of licorice pizza? Yeah, so uh, I, I've seen it uh, twice in theaters. Uh, I saw it on New Year's Eve at Ronnie's, which uh, this was another kind of bizarre Ronnie's experience for different reasons than the Jackass one. Stop going to Ronnie's, man. <laughs> it's not always bad, bizarre experiences. It's just bizarre experiences. But anyways, when I got out of the first screening, I got on my phone, and that was when I learned that Betty White just died. <laughs> so that was, that was, that was, was a you. weird moment. Uh, yeah, and then I just watched it um, again for the second time at um, Plaza Front Neck, which I'm not a huge fan of that theater. I'm not a huge fan of going to that mall, but uh, they get good movies in there. So, you know, sometimes you got to do it. But what was cool about this one though, was like before the movie, they played a music video by the Himes. Uh, it was uh, Lost Touch. That was, a, that was a song. So that was cool. Just kind of seeing something, just a little bonus thing before the movie. I think that I enjoyed it more the second time I watched it. It's one of those like you see it more for what it is than I guess because like I going in, I had no idea what this movie was. It was just like everybody's talking about this licorice pizza movie. I guess I'm gonna f-ing go see this one. Seeing it again, I think I really enjoyed it even more than I did the first time. Um, I, I, I think the characters are all really fascinating in their own way and something i really appreciate about it is it's a much more like honest to god period piece because like of course pta knows what he's doing in that regard a lot of period piece stuff you see these days is just trying to do the stranger things thing i was just like oh we have all these media references everywhere oh did you know that the evil dead came out in the 1980s we got a poster just all all that kind of stuff like the worst perpetrators of that were the fear street movies god i could go on a rant about that but i won't yeah i think that it, it feels like the period that it is trying to emulate not that i was alive in the 70s but what aren't you 62 yeah you know you're right i i was i was in uh carbonite during that period uh so oh yeah that's what they froze you that's what they froze you for 20 years you're not john peters <laughs> yeah yeah you yeah, came back out right, in the 90s right next to walt disney um <laughs> really it felt much more honest than a lot of the kind of period stuff that you see these days and characters all very well-rounded and quirky in their own way it's a lot of just like dumb people realizing that they're dumb but you know rolling with it <laughs> that, that's probably all i've got um Someone smart say something. Well, that leads to only one place. <laughs> I'm not smart, Austin. Leave me alone. Tanner is the only person in this room who actually got into Mensa. Let us know what you think of licorice pizza. What's Mensa? Yo! All right, Tanner, uh, you're, you're the last in the rotation. You want to talk about the movie? I just cut my leg <laughs> on my chair. I'm very smart. Ow, f- 
I'm good. I'm Medic. good. I don't think it's bleeding. I don't Stop think it's bleeding. Stop hurting yourself on podcasts, my dude. Well, you know, after hitting myself in the nuts for the jackass one, I just had to top it. So, uh, when I woke up this morning, I told myself, I'm going to rewatch Licorice Pizza for today's podcast. And then I played Hot Wheels Unleashed and Apex Legends with my friends for five hours. So, uh, you could say it's pretty fresh by mind. I think I saw it first out of all of us here. No, Sydney beat me to it because you like went out. Of, you like went to a different city to see it the first time, I think. I took a bus to New York and I saw it twice back to back and it was the best day of my f***ing life. That sounds incredible. Yeah, I had to wait for it to come to theaters here. So I think I saw it. It was the same day you saw the it because 30th, I walked maybe. Out, when I walked out of the theater, I checked my phone and saw that you were going into it. Cool. <laughs> okay, so it's been like almost a month, over a month, half a month. Two, so. Closer to two at this point. Yeah, it's been a while. It's, been, it's still pretty fresh. It's fresh enough in my mind because uh, here's here's my pitch of my opinion for this movie. This was my favorite movie of the year until the last 60 seconds. I'm gonna get into that because the reasons why are personal, but and I wanna talk about what I liked first, which was basically everything. There's this new thing that's been coming out these past few years, like the hangout movie type of thing. You know, you got Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and I can't think of any other examples, but hangout movies, characters hanging out, have a good time. Not a lot of plot happens or whatever because I don't know reasons, but all the characters are really fun and engaging. I like to imagine this is a prequel to Punch Drunk Love because Cooper Hoffman is a mattress salesman. I just want to imagine he continues that path later down the line, which maybe speaks poorly on what I think of the character. I don't know, because Philip Seymour Hoffman in Punch Drunk Love is kind of a dick. <laughs> kind of. Just a little bit. Right to take shut up! Will you shut up! Shut up! Shut, 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 shut up! Shut up! The, the guy um, from the shut the f*** up meme. Uh, that, that guy's just a little bit of a dick. <laughs> just, a little, just the teetsiest bitch. I think I love the second half of the movie more than the first half of the movie. When the second half of the movie kind of just devolves into a series of different vignettes for a bit. But it's just really entertaining. I love the way this movie looks. PTA shot this on film and he had a someone help him shoot it whose name's escaping me right now i it's hard it's almost hard to talk about it because a lot of what sydney said i think really resonates with me a lot of what tim said really resonates with me especially being accurate to the time period including maybe some of the time periods more problematic aspects like you know racism mm. um should we just take the cat out of the bag and talk about that bit sure with the the, the higgins bit higgins the higgins does a voice and it's not cool Here's the thing about the Higgins bit. Doing the voice, I don't think worked because the much funnier bit through those two scenes is that it's a different woman each time. <laughs> All right. Hi, Miyoko. No, 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 Miyoko's gone. This is my new wife, Kimiko. <laughs> Hi, Kimiko. Pretty as a picture. And that's a lot less of offensive bit, but I also think a more funny bit. <laughs> and I think he should have focused on that instead of the voice thing. I think the voice thing was weird. Yes. Um, it, it gets harder to watch. Like, I, like, watching it today, I was like, yeah, like, this gets worse every... <laughs> Viewing, <laughs> I, it seems like we're starting to reach a consent. Everyone's like, "Yeah, we can just acknowledge now that this just like didn't work." Not, and, not the best bit. And his response, like PTA, you're really testing my loyalty. Well, Austin and I were talking about this. He had two different responses. His first one was better. His most recent one was ridiculous. It was strange. He completely <laughs> nailed it the first time. I think he might have been talking to the New York Times, and he brought up how it was like based off of experiences that his mother-in-law had as a young. Jazz musician and all this stuff, and sort of like he, he didn't fumble over his words and say all this strange. Shit. And Tanner sends me the huh. screenshot from like a month later or something, and he's talking about like it's not a huh with a dot 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 or some some bonkers. <laughs> it was so weird. <laughs> okay, yeah, I didn't see the first one, but I've seen that one, and I'm like, yeah, the second geez, one is a like, horrible answer. It's so yeah. weird. Yeah, at least he admits that he can uh, miss the mark in that second one. That's. I guess Kinda. something like a saving grace. <laughs> He's kind of like, well, maybe I messed up. <laughs> yeah, he was know. like, I'm definitely capable of missing the mark, but I don't know what everyone's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> are, are we the baddies? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think my favorite part of the movie overall is probably the same thing as everyone's of his favorite part, which is everything with Bradley Cooper in it, especially <laughs> the driving down the hill backwards in the truck sequence, which is oh, like... Yeah. 
one of the most exciting sequences of the year, and it's so small. Eat your heart out, Black Widow flying off of spaceships. <laughs> this girl drove backwards on a truck, and it was more exciting. Sorry. I love the uh, Sean Penn bit. I think it was Sean Penn, where the funniest yeah. shot in the movie is when she's when he's about to ride on the motorcycle, and Alana Haim just f***ing eats sh- as he takes off. Like, in the movie, it's, it's like, oh, God, is she okay? But also, just, like, the way it was shot was, like, whoop, whoop, it was funny. It's really funny. The movie's really funny. And you hear the guitar crack. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing I liked most about the movie is I thought Gary and Alana's relationship was sort of perfectly balanced. It was a little flirtatious, but it didn't feel overtly romantic for the most part. It was a little problematic, but it straddled the line very well, in my opinion, for most part. You know, Gary was really the aggressor through most of it. Not the aggressor. That makes it sound like he's <laughs> the initiator, the initiator. Yeah. Uh, Alana. And, you know, it works as Gary. I don't want to say this because it sounds weird, but Gary is pretty mature for a 15 year old. Alana is kind of immature sometimes for a 25 year old. Kind of. Um, <laughs> OK, I didn't want to go. OK, she's pretty freaking immature for a 25 year old. <laughs> um, so they, it's kind of a match that makes sense. But obviously that kind of age gap is problematic. And but he was nailing it. He was nailing it. And then they kissed. And I actually had a panic attack in the theater. Oh, no. I, um, I've been trying to talk about this more publicly anyway, but when I was 17... Look, I was raped by a woman when I was 17. Um, and she was 10 years older than me. Um, so <laughs> it kind of just hit too close to home in that sense. But because of that, yeah. it just hit this sour note for me. And I understand why it doesn't bother other people. It just was. And it was such a shame because I really thought PTA was nailing it. Honestly, either they shouldn't have kissed or they should have kissed, but make it more obvious that this relationship is fundamentally not going to work. Because I think most of the movie makes it obvious that they're not Destined. Dad, perfect yeah. of a match, sure. you know, romantically. They're great friends, but I don't think they work well as a romantic pair. I wish the ending hammered that home more. Mm-hmm. The ending just, it, it's such a sour note at such the last minute for me that I just wish it was better. Because again, I love everything before that. I think maybe that bit could have worked if like they cut right at like her going, you f- idiot and just walking off but yeah i pretty much agree that there's that, also the weird yeah. adr when they're running away i it was really weird it sounded weird it sounded like it was recorded yeah. on the back of a tin can <laughs> i love you gary what are you doing in my swamp <laughs> oh it was shrek with michael myers in the back of the limo again <laughs> yeah now that I've ruined the mood by talking about my trauma, back to you, Austin. <laughs> it's fine. Paul Thomas Anderson's no stranger to touching the electric rail. Like victims of abuse who are molested by parents might have a hard time with that one scene in Magnolia. People who escape the cult of Scientology might have a hard time with the master. Prudes have a hard time with Boogie Nights. Sometimes the, his movies touch on subjects that make people uncomfortable. And really, you can have personal things in your life that just will ruin a movie, you know? That happens to people. You you can't control what happens to your viewers. Which sucks because I was really, really loving it. I was starting to think, I think I like this more than Punch Drunk Love. Sure. It's so weird. I've never had a movie lose so much goodwill with me in such a short period of time. It's gone in 60 seconds, but it's just your opinion of licorice pizza. <laughs> yeah, it went from favorite movie of the year to I don't think it made my top 40. It's a shame that that happened, but it's completely valid what you felt. So having yeah. seen licorice pizza twice now, I think it's another fascinating entry into Paul Thomas Anderson's catalog of sort of artsy, mid-budget, award season darling films that he always seems to make. My read on the movie is that it's a fairly gentle exam in media literacy and history. Like, if I'm thinking of ending things, that Charlie Kaufman film is very hard mode, where it's like, I gotta watch a bunch of movies and read a bunch of books and be a certain age to get this film. Like, Licorice Pizza, meanwhile, has all of its trappings explained in one line of dialogue and a kind of cursory understanding of what society was like. 50 years ago, and that line of dialogue is uttered by Matthew Marshall when Alana is taking him home from the sort of failed dinner date with the closeted politician, Joel Walks. Matthew says, They're all shit, aren't they? 
And that line applies to most of the men in this film. Like basically anybody on top of the 70s power hierarchy, the power dynamics are significantly more f***ed up than how they are now. And this is sort of where media literacy comes in. The film is like a groovy little time machine. Every prop, every car, every set, every wardrobe, every song is lovingly just put in there to transport you back to the 70s. And you can really see Sailors where- Sailors fighting in the dance hall. Yeah, everybody loves that. Everybody loves when Life on Mars comes on. Literally one of my favorite scenes of the film was when it came on. <laughs> Coming of age films with David Bowie, people like Perks, people like this. Then, you know, inside of this groovy time capsule, you have these sort of like sinister normal presenting people, like sexual harassment at work, racist husbands, mentally unstable and violent celebrities who threaten kids. There's a lot of very lame sh going down around the adults. And if you're Alana, who's in like the earliest stage of adulthood, the alternative presented to you hilariously is this 15 year old guy who's trying to act more mature because he's got kind of absent parents. But even if the younger generation may, uh, may end up being kinder and better than their elders about social norms, they're douchebags now because they're teenagers. Teenagers who are dumb for reasons related to their immaturity. Even though there's a lot of films that like present the 70s as this like groovy utopian decade, Licorice Pizza paints the era very plainly with all of its faults included. And I think a popular misreading of Licorice Pizza is that like PTA said it in the 70s so he could do all these things that he secretly thinks are still cool. Yeah, a bunch of nerd morons who think that. <laughs> Another misreading would be just like the cultural imagination of how Americans think the 70s were fun because it has this glorified representation in other movies that are less critical of the time period makes all these sinister things seem like they have like a good old days sticker on them. Like how did other movies get away with making the 70s look good? Everyone that lived through the 70s universally agreed that that decade just sucked. That it just really sucked. There were like how did we get away with making people think it was cool? Was it all dazed and confused? Is this Linklater's fault? Is this my boy Richard <laughs> Linklater's fault? It's it's an immortal thing. People, every 20 years, they look back at their childhoods and they just ignore all the their parents were dealing with and doing and they're just like, oh, man, God. I wish it was then. You just made me realize the aughts. People are going to start romanticizing 2003 and shit. God. Yeah, we're gonna, <laughs> gonna have be like horrifying. A, a movie about people in a Call of Duty lobby and they're just like, man, I love you. I can't wait to play Call of Duty with you. Yeah, like they weren't <laughs> just screaming racial slurs at each other. <laughs> God. So in, in short, I don't believe either of those misreadings. I enjoyed the honest time capsule with all the antiques on display. And as a story about how weird it must have been growing up in that era and being that age, it totally landed for me. And as usual, it's a technical accomplishment thanks to Kodak Film Stock, a world class crew and a coterie of actors who knock every scene out of the park. I can't believe this is our two leads first time acting as far as I know. Maybe Cooper's yeah. done something, but I'm pretty sure Alana has done nothing before this other than like music videos. Yeah, it's like that Coen Brothers magic from True Grit where you just take this fresh face and then they just knock it out of the park. Bingo, yeah. And, and lastly, as somebody who was raised Jewish, this film nails the way that non-Orthodox Jews behave. I appreciated the Jewishisms on display. Austin, I remember watching it and I was thinking of you. Every time Alana was with her family, I thought of you. I was like, Austin's loving this scene right now. <laughs> Especially the nose bit. You have a very Jewish nose, <laughs> which is becoming very fashionable. Let's well, quick impromptu <laughs> question. Who is everybody's favorite character besides Bradley Cooper? Can you think of one? Oh, come on! I, I would say the casting agent lady. Harriet Sansom Harris. I loved her. I liked um, Gary's little brother. It might be Alana. The main character of the movie is one of my favorite characters. What a f***ing surprise. Gotta stop fighting with everyone all the time. Oh, f*** off, Danielle. If not her, then Benny Safty, maybe. I, I have a thing for closeted gay politicians. <laughs> like, I have a thing. That's my type. If I go to Grinder. Are you closeted and politician? Hook up now. <laughs> Are you politician? Tim, favorite character. Yeah, I, honestly, I think I'd have to agree with Alana because I think there's just like a lot of like relatability to kind of the struggle 
Um, she's going We're through. We're all in our twenties. Yeah, it's terrifying out here. That kind of realization that uh, am I doing something that I should be doing? You know, yeah, really interesting. Following her, I, I wish I talked about it more because she is really such one of PTA's better main character. I think this might be PTA's best script ever honestly i really love the script for this i love the dialogue i love the scenes i love the way these people talk to each other in general god it's 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 such a hard question the character question because pta just nailed it on all of them they're all fun and interesting in their own way even if most of them are shitty people especially sean penn sean penn is the funniest shitty person yeah. to me because he he's he just felt the most transparently slimy trying to get into alana's pants and for some reason i just found it funny. he's doing lines from war movies to try to pick her up. Was like the only time I feel at peace is in the jungle. The jungle. That's where I'm most myself. Yeah, because you, you think he's talking about being at war first, and then his drunk director friend Tom Waits says the name of the movie he was doing a bit from. Did anyone notice John C. Riley's cameo the first time they watched it? Because I did. Yeah, I did, I, yeah. I don't think I noticed it the first time, but I noticed it this time. He's the Frankenstein at the, the convention. He's the monster's it's, it's like, character. Yeah, I'll take photos with you, but it hasn't started yet. Come on, yeah. kid. <laughs> Gotta have John C. Riley in your PTA movie. That wraps up our general discussion on licorice pizza. Let's take a quick break to do some trivia. This film features a lot of cameos from friends of PTA and PTA's family. His wife's in there, his kids, Steven Spielberg's daughter, Sasha, Leo DiCaprio's father, George, John C. Riley, as we what? just mentioned, Jonathan Demme's nephew, and more. Wait, Leo's dad is in this? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's the waterbed salesman. He's the guy who's like, it's far out, man. That's Leonardo DiCaprio's father? That is the that is the ball sack Leo DiCaprio came from. That is the one who gave birth. Is Leo's birth. dad an actor? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Has Leo come from acting parents this whole time and nobody told me? That's a great question. Well, his dad's a real actor. He only does performance art nude in parks. So that's why he hasn't been in many Hell movies. Yeah, my guy. <laughs> it's been busy. <laughs> Gary's character is modeled off of Gary Goatsman, a friend of PTA's who used to be a child actor and then briefly became a waterbed salesman using the same name to sell his waterbeds as the one in this movie. G uh, Gary went on to be a film producer wor working on such films as Silence of the Lambs, Philadelphia, and The Ant Bully. Three of the greatest films ever made. I remember when I saw Ant Bully the first time. I sh I cried, I threw up. <laughs> Just cinema at its finest right there. I actually did cry at my screening of the Aunt Bully because someone from the Disney Channel. So it was like a press, like some kind of early screening for kids. And someone from Disney Channel was giving away uh, an ant farm as like a contest. And I like was in third place and some kid shouted my name to f me up and I wound up losing. I actually had a meltdown in the theater. My mom had to walk me out and before we, I missed like the first eight minutes of the movie because of it. <laughs> I gotta make a note, stop bringing up movies that make Tanner sad. I'm sorry, I said the Ant Bully. How could, the hell could you have known? I was like, ah, oh, the Ant Bully. I have a traumatic story about the Ant Bully. <laughs> Who remembers the Ant Bully? Then you can't blame yourself for that. <laughs> Uh, among many other things, like music playlists and radio broadcasts, Paul Thomas Anderson made the two leads watch episodes of The Partridge Family and M.A.S.H. in order to get into their roles. Wow. Did Gary play a vet and I wasn't noticing? <laughs> <laughs> M.A.S.H. M.A.S.H. <laughs> he, he just puts him in on the it's not a chicken, it's a baby scene and just makes him watch that over and over again. Crack that baby right open. The film Rainbow from Licorice Pizza is based off the 1970s 73 May September romance film Breezy, directed by Clint Eastwood. Uh, look up what May September romance means. It's it's f***ed up. Uh, this film was shot with two of the cameras that shot The Force Awakens and borrowed carbon arc lights from the same supplier that rented them to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. The house that they used as a stand-in for John Peters' house actually belonged to Lyle Wagner, the actor who played Steve Trevor in the 70s Wonder Woman show. I know that. I know that guy. Holy sh**. You know that. You know Chris that Pine? Kind of... Yeah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Chris, Chris Pine. It's always Chris Pine. <laughs> through, all, through all iterations of Wonder Woman, it is Chris Pine always. <laughs> Mordecai Haim, uh, Alana's father in the movie and in real life, improvised his lines. Those are his no organic way. reactions to the things. <laughs> Wait, really? So all the circumcision that. stuff, that was all him? Uh, he, he wasn't outside asking the boy if his penis was circumcised, but he, he was <laughs> improv and getting pissed off at Shabbat oh dinner. Oh my God, I forgot how much I loved that scene. <laughs> 
And when she walks in in the bikini, and he just goes, "What the? What the? I love him. He's my new. I I changed my answer. Alana's dad. That's my new answer. Now that I know who's all improvised. Tanner, Tanner's the dad movie. Oh, it is a dad movie. We got one in. Good that Alana's dad taught her Krav Maga, which is, you know, a form of karate. It's more like how to use a pen to stab someone's eye out. You're a goddamn fighter, aren't you? I like that. The motorcycle scene at the golf course is actually based off of San Fernando Valley legend that Evil Knievel came to the Ramshorn restaurant one night, got completely drunk, and then either one of two things, he ate total shit in the parking lot or he jumped over three cars. I like to think both happened. <laughs> at the off. same time. I like to think at the same time. Like, yeah. if you look at the background of the shots, there's like another like thing of fire off in the distance. <laughs> he jumps the three cars and then eats <laughs> <laughs> Alana Haim actually did used to babysit Cooper Hoffman when he was younger. This is referenced in a lie that Gary makes up when he's trying to score in the movie. No, she works for me. She's been my babysitter. I did not know that. Hollywood is hell. They had to kiss. <laughs> Paul Thomas Anderson has known Cooper Hoffman since he was like three days old. Well, yeah, him and Philip were good, da good, good yeah. dads. I, I mean, I assume they're both good fathers, but no, good friends. Of course, the part that I referenced at the start of this for anyone who's been out of the loop, Paul Thomas Anderson had an art teacher when he went to Buckley named Donna Rose. Years later, when he met with the Hyam sisters for the first time, hoping to direct a music video for them, one of them, Estee, I think it was, mentioned that their mom, now named Donna Hyam, was the Miss Rose from his youth. Paul then proceeded to bring a painting of the mountain from Close Encounters of the Third Kind out of his son's room and revealed to the three sisters that he kept the paintings from their mom's class all these years. He's so weird. How did Maya Rudolph feel about all this? <laughs> How did Maya Rudolph feel? <laughs> well, I want to imagine Maya sees PTA taking the painting out of their son's room and it's like, Hey, babe, what you doing? <laughs> What's going on? That doesn't look like a mini Ripperton record. <laughs> and that wraps up the trivia. Now that we've had our round table, what's everybody's final words on licorice pizza in case you want to get anything else in edgewise? Uh, we'll start with Tim. Movie good. Yeah. He always pulls it off. <laughs> He always pulls it off. It's always beautiful. Tanner! First off, I'd like to apologize for the audience about the traumatic story I brought up without warning f anyone. Uh, as far as that goes, like I said, it is a really great movie. And I'm willing to bet when I watch it a second time, knowing what happens at the end, it's not going to bother me anymore. It was just genuinely, since he was nailing it so perfectly the whole time, I didn't think it would suddenly be unnailed. I didn't think it was going to pull the nail out with a hammer. How do I think hammers work? They have a back end where you pull out nails. Oh! <laughs> Ow! Back to you, Austin. And our final, final thoughts person, Sydney. Um, yeah, movie good. Uh, there was something I wanted to mention earlier in the <laughs> in the way that like I really loved a lot, and I Alon is my favorite character. Also, I was kind of joking when I said Gary's little brother, but just <laughs> the way that it was portrayed, like women in the '70s, and how she was constantly seeking male validation, but Gary was the only one who really saw her and respected her and truly loved her for who she was. And that was another thing that I loved about her character so much. And I just related to her a lot in all the legal ways. <laughs> but, um, Very yeah, legal. <laughs> no crime. Um, yeah, incredible, incredible movie. My favorite of 2021, as Tanner knows. Yeah, I watch your videos. I'm a real fan. Yeah. Thanks. That thanks sounded so ungenuine. I know you meant it genuinely, Tanner, but you sounded thank like, you yeah, thanks, you piece so of much. Why don't you go fucking die in a hole? <laughs> that's it for me. God, I love how they always run to each other. That's that's such a fun romantic thing is that they go to each other. I know they're running. Yo, if you like running, watch this movie if you like running. They're so, oh my God. When they run the first time, I always, I have cried every time. When, after he gets arrested. That's an emotional scene too. And like she run, and she's so worried about him. Oh, oh, no, no. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. 
Now Tanner's crying, thinking of their young love. How could you? Aww. I was young and in love once. I was engaged at the age of 20. I get it. Yeah. You were? Yeah, it didn't end well. <laughs> Don't get engaged at 20, kids. Horrible, horrible mistake. I, I'm, I made it through. I didn't do that. <laughs> Your high school sweetheart is never the woman you're actually going to, or man, if you're gay, or if you're a woman. You're never going to stay married to your high school sweetheart is the point. That- it's that true. happens. Well, it didn't happen to me, said Nicole. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm not actually upset. It's a bit. <laughs> I, I mean, I was actually I enga- Austin, please save me from embarrassing myself further. Licorice pizza reminds me of a much <laughs> less blunt last night in Soho. While parts of it were despicable and ugly, other parts were sweet and charming. And I'm thankful for all the effort the cast and crew went through to take audiences back in time, considering how much right now sucks. I'd recommend it if you're a fan of the director or of that decade. Thank you for coming on today and talking with us, Sydney. Is there anything that you would like to plug? Subscribe to my YouTube. Subscribe to Bomb Squad Productions. (laughs) 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 That's it. Follow me on Twitter. Uh, she is uh, very smart, very insightful, and fantastic reviewer. Follow her, her letterbox, too. Tanner. <laughs> I made it genuine. Why do you think I want you on here? I don't invite idiots on. I'm the only Whoa. idiot that's allowed on here. It's true. We have a rule. <laughs> <laughs> Token yeah, idiot. Yeah, I make them take an IQ test if I'm not sure. <laughs> Be sure to check that out. And that concludes our film today. If you're listening to us on any of the audio platforms, please leave us a review so we can maybe trick the algorithm algorithm paying attention to us um if you're watching this on spotify video i hope you've enjoyed this week's latest batch of uncensored profanity remember to visit our patreon if you want to support the crew who work really hard to bring you daily content tune into the beta test next week if you're watching on youtube thank you for your support and our eternal struggle against the monetization and copyright bots uh go down to the comments below and let us know do you like licorice pizza What's your favorite Paul Thomas Anderson film? Will the Zoomers spare us in the oncoming purges? Uh, hey, Sydney and I are Zoomers, and the answer is no. Damn. We're kind of cusper. I don't identify with all that. I do. <laughs> I, I found out apparently 96 is the cutoff year for millennials. So I think you and I are both well in it. Yeah, but we're still 90s babies. I didn't have regular internet access until I was nine, so I don't really identify with the Zoomers who've had it their entire life, but you know. Yeah, if your first phone wasn't an iPhone, I feel like you can. My first phone was a, like a little dumb phone. I had the slidey I, I, I one. I did T9. Yeah. I had to do T9. I know how to do T9. <laughs> nice. No internet on the phone. I shared my first phone with my brother. Oh, damn. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You are 47 after all, Tim. Tim, when do you turn 30 again? I thought he was 60. You cannot know the answer. <laughs> Don't, don't uh, put my actual birthday in the podcast. Tim, Tim is all ages simultaneously. It's the Irish blood in him, eh? <laughs> Are you nutty? Is that offensive? No. This has been the Bomb Squad Podcast, episode number 55. My name's Austin Zwiebelman, and this one's for you, Paul. From the desert to the sea to all of Southern California, Bomb Squad Podcast at 7 is signing off. I drink your milkshake. I drink it up. I slid my ticket across the table and I said, sorry guys, I gotta see about a girl.